Welcome back, friends. Thank you for joining us. Today, we are diving into part two of my conversation with Irene Rollins. If you haven't listened to part one, go ahead in the back in the episode prior. It's called Overcoming Alcohol Addiction. Um, you're not going to want to miss that conversation, whether or not you you know, struggle with an alcohol addiction. Um, it's a really good conversation. Let me tell you about Irene again. Irene Rollins is passionate about people's physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual health. She is a certified emotional intelligent coach and she teaches, she uh, writes, and she is a wife and a mother of three. And her and her husband, Jimmy, also have a wonderful ministry. If you are married, that can really benefit you called two equals one. And she wrote the book, Reframe Your Shame, Experience Freedom from What Holds You Back. And we really recommend it. So today we are talking with Irene about something that is not really popular in our culture and can even be looked down upon. And we are talking about, uh, you know, not having alcohol be a part of your life or um, living sober. And I just first want to preface this by by saying this conversation, if you do drink, is not to shame you at all. It's just we're going to be sharing a, a little bit of a conversation between the two of us of why alcohol is no longer a part of our lives and how that has brought life and peace to us. Um, so Irene, I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. It's one I've been wanting to have for a while and I couldn't think of anyone else I would rather have it with. Um, and you have a really unique, um, view of definition of sobriety, which you're going to dive into. Um, you define it not just as abstinence from alcohol or an addiction, you divine it as deeper than that. So we're going to have you share about that. But then we're also going to talk about, you know, life without alcohol as well. Um, and so will you, you've been sober now, you said for eight years, is that yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, following a serious addiction to alcohol that almost destroyed your life, your marriage, uh, you went to recovery, um, you still work on your recovery. Um, and, um, and so talk to us a little bit more about your understanding of sobriety in regards to the deeper, your deeper, uh, reflection on it, as well as, you know, abstaining from alcohol. Sure. So, um, I like to tell people that abstinence, it does not mean sobriety, <laughs> abstinence from uh, the, a, a substance maybe, or a person if you're a love addict or a thing if you're a gamer and you abuse gaming or spending money or what have you, abstinence from it is just the beginning of a process of healing. Um, it's when we confess it first that we the, the, the shame kind of uh, loses its power over us and we begin this process of saying, um, I'm ready to do work to get well. What does getting well mean? Um, sobriety uh, really is the beginning of this process of recovery where we can, I believe it's us pursuing wholeness, doing mm -hmm. our part to pursue wholeness um, and healing from what really led us to drink or abuse that substance or allow that person to abuse us. If it's, uh, you know, you're in abusive relationship after abusive relationship, it's really not just about alcohol. It's about mm -hmm. all of the things that got you to that point of abusing that substance mm -hmm. or thing, uh, mm -hmm. or place or whatever it is that you're doing too much of. So anything out of moderation can lead to addiction. So we have to ask ourselves the question, is there something in my life that could be getting out of hand? Is it unforgiveness? Is it um, maybe my grief? I'm stuck in my grief. I'm angry at God. I haven't forgiven someone. We, th those are things that I, I, I like to say recovery applies to us all because we all have hurts, hangups, mm -hmm. and habits. The hang up could be, um, you know, that unforgiveness, the hurt, abuse, trauma, um, neglect in your childhood, uh, rejection, right? And then all of the habits, again, anything you might start out innocently, but when it's increased and you can't stop on your own, you're having relational issues, um, maybe the consequences are increasing and you can't stop then you're more in your habit has become an, an addiction. So 
Yeah. So I believe that um, once we confess it, it loses its power. We get in community to continue to have accountability and work on staying away and abstaining from that thing. But mm -hmm. really it's that deeper work internally on our soul, our emotions that is going to uh, be the determining factor on if we stay sober or not. Mm -hmm. That's really good. I like how you explain it is this journey towards wholeness, you know, mm -hmm. e examining those childhood wounds, examining maybe if there's codependency in your life um, mm -hmm. and how it's, it's so interesting how you say it. It's, it's not just abstaining right from alcohol, but it's this journey towards wholeness. I, I find that really, um, really fascinating. And it's not really a definition that I think a lot of people have, you know, so thank you so much for sharing that. So, uh, we are going to have a little bit of a conversation, Irene and I, about what our lives, um, look like without having alcohol. Um, after Irene shares, I'm going to share a little bit about my story, uh, why I um, no longer have alcohol be a part of my life. Um, so Irene, why don't you go first? What is your life now, like now that you are walking in sobriety, you are on this journey towards constant recovery through, uh, to wholeness? Um, tell us more about what your life is like now. Well, now I, um, I'm a, really a recovery activist, I like to say. Um, I do my best to share my story, not to bring glory to me, but mm -hmm. to really brag on the Jesus that saved me from myself. Um, it's God's grace that rescued me when I admitted my alcoholism. It's like he strengthened me. I thought, admitting my alcoholism was going to take me out. Like it, the mm. shame was going to kill me. People are going to look at me crazy. Um, you know, I'm going to embarrass our family, but really um, that confession, that day 38 of my rehab journey was the beginning of this new incredible life that God had for me. And what every time I uh, confess my alcoholism, which just means that I can never drink again. It doesn't mean I am bad or, you know, I'm not speaking something negative over myself. All I'm saying is that I can never drink again because I abused it to the point where my brain is, it's toxic immediately to my brain. I can't have one. I'll desire a thousand if alcohol mm -hmm. touches my lips. That's what alcoholism means to me. So I share because, you know, people don't know about it. I didn't know about alcoholism. I didn't know that if I abused anything enough, I would end up addicted to it. Uh, it sounds like common sense now, but back then, honestly, in my early 30s, it just wasn't talked about. I didn't know anybody who was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. um, so my life today is studying the thing that almost took me out. I study alcoholism. I study codependency. I became an emotional intelligence coach and got the certification really not to do one-on-one -on -one coaching, but so that I could really understand the, my emotional world, because that is really at the end of the day, what led me to drink in the first place to medicate my pain that was internal. So by getting that certification, now I can share with my family, Hey guys, we're not, we're going to stop this whole generational thing of, um, mm -hmm. that we adopted, I adopted from my family of the no talk rule. We're going to share our emotions. How did that feel? Mm -hmm. You know, the good, the bad, and the ugly and process through it all in a healthy way and create a safe environment where my children would feel comfortable sharing, not mm -hmm. for mom and dad to come and fix it, but for us to listen to understand them so they would feel known and heard and really that's what where the healing began in our family so mm -hmm. what does it look like it looked like me going to rehab me studying all of these issues that led me to drink in the first place it's counseling countless hours of counseling it's being in celebrate recovery going to all i liked all women aa meetings because I don't like it when guys try to hit on me when I'm <laughs> trying to go to a meeting. So took away that distraction and just did women. And I really enjoyed learning about um, 
like other people's stories to help me stay sober. I learned how to avoid relapse that way. Like I learned about being a dry drunk. Like I'd never heard of that before. What do you and mean by that? So it's, so a dry drunk is someone again, who might abstain from alcohol, but you still have all the symptoms that led you to drink in the first place. You're still mm-hmm. codependent. Oh, wow. You're still, yeah. You're still um, emotionally unwell. So mm-hmm. like, it's a sign that you might be a dry drunk if your life is still the same as it was before you got sober. Hmm. It's just absent of the drink. Wow. That's so interesting. I have never heard that before. I refuse for that to be the case. Right. So I am going to do everything in my own power to Mm -hmm. work on my emotional health, my spiritual health, so that Mm -hmm. I'm not walking around a dry drunk. Hmm. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's, that's so interesting. Um, so in the last episode, overcoming alcohol addiction, you gave a glimpse into us how, um, you know, your life was really out of control. You almost lost your marriage. Um, and you almost lost your family really hit rock bottom. So, can you contrast like your frame of mind, like the, the quality of your life then versus like, what is your life like now? I mean, I just see you have so much light and you have so much life. Um, so how are you feeling now today, now that you are in recovery? I'm just full of life and forgiveness. Like I've been forgiven. My kids forgave me. My husband has forgiven me um, every day that they uh, celebrate me and my recovery has given me the um, courage to step out and share my story. And then what keeps me going is all the people who send me their testimonies, who share their stories with me, who tell me that, hey, I didn't realize I had a problem until I heard you talking about it. Um, I didn't realize that what I was doing was abnormal or headed towards addiction. Um, People are living in secret shame uh, stuffing and numbing themselves and medicating because they don't think that they, they're like, if, if, if someone found out about this, it's the end of me. Well, mm-hmm. I'm here to tell you that it's actually the best thing I ever did was coming out and getting help and mm-hmm. talking about it because my life is so much richer. Every person who tells me how they got free from hearing my testimony helps keep me sober another day. It's mm-hmm. accountability. Because let me tell you, I'm like, I would never want to disappoint all the people who have shared how mm-hmm. the, me being open in a way that they can't, don't, don't feel like they can. God, mm-hmm. this must be my assignment here on this earth. So yeah. I wrote about it. I wrote a book to expose people to what a journey looks like because it's not a big story about Irene's life. Boring. Everybody has stories, right? But storytelling saves lives. So Mm -hmm. Jesus talked in parables. So what I did was I took a book and I said, Hey, let me, let's reframe the way we look at things we're shameful of, not just alcohol, but hurts, hangups, habits that apply to us Mm -hmm. all. And let me expose you to what getting healthy looks like. That way, perhaps you can take some pieces that you can apply to your own life for your wholeness mm-hmm. and give mm-hmm. away what you got. That's why I'm happy. Cause I give away everything I got, everything mm-hmm. the Lord gives me everything. Mm-hmm. I just want to give it away. And wow. that is so redemptive. Yeah. Isn't it? Mm, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't waste anything when we give it to him. It's Nothing. just beautiful. Um, so I, I would like to share a little bit about my decision. Um, well, there's many reasons, but why I um, don't have alcohol be a part of my life. Um, and, you know, it's it's really not culturally pop- popular. You know, alcohol is is like so ingrained in our culture. It is like the fabric of our society. It's inescapable. It's even prevalent and welcomed in churches. You know, there can be um, men who get together and have beer and Bible study and things like that. Um, So it's such a part of our culture in and out of the church. And um, 
and it can be hard, you know, not in social situations, you going and people always ask like, well, why don't you drink? Which is like, never ask someone that question. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, ask, like a woman, like, are you pregnant? You know what I mean? Um, I share this in the first part, but my grandparents were both alcoholics on my mom's side, um, severe, severe alcoholics. And there was abuse. Um, my grandfather used amphetamines, alcohol, um, physically abused. Um, my grandmother um, was, you know, verbally, emotionally abusive to my aunts and uncles, my mom. And that had such a traumatic effect on my family and even carried through that generational um um, impact. And, uh, on both sides of my grandmother, my grandfather's, there's just so much alcoholism. Um, I, you know, have Irish roots and that is so much part of, of that culture. Um, and, and, and so also, um, there's also a lot of mental health challenges too on that side of the family. Um, and so, you know, in, in high school, I party was part of that scene. Um, you know, I just always, you know, would, would drink and just assume that that was going to be a part of my life. But when I struggled with severe, severe depression, um, that really changed me. And when I was 21, I, I went to Vegas with friends to celebrate my 21st birthday. And um, I was severely depressed. I mean, I was so depressed. I remember being in that casino and thinking like, almost like if I could just, you know, jump off or I mean, I was severely, severely depressed. And, you know, I had the knowledge that alcohol was a depressant and that it made um, mental health challenges even worse. And um, that again, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so my friend ordered me a glass of red wine, which, you know, wasn't like the typical like shot or whatever, but let's start a little more sophisticated. Here's a glass of red wine. Mm -hmm. And, um, I remember that wine glass just being right in front of me. And I remember smelling that kind of fermented that smell. Mm -hmm. And it was like, God just, made it clear or just told me and, and was like, no, I am not going to drink this. I'm, I'm not going to drink. Um, and I didn't even take a sip and I pushed it away from the table. And so it was in a Vegas casino on my 21st birthday that I stopped. I decided I wasn't going to have alcohol be a part of my life. And mm -hmm. I will tell you, it was one of the absolute best decisions of my life. I am just so grateful um, that I don't have it be a part of my life. I mean, I just have so much health and vitality, um, mm -hmm. you know, free from the physical effects um, and just feel so good. Alcoholism is really deep in my family and um, it has spared me from even worth uh, worst mental health um, struggles because I have um, experienced mental health battles from the time I was 18, even into my 30s. And I know that if I had allowed alcohol to be a part of my life, I I believe that I would have medicated um, with myself, which probably happened to my grandfather. I think he had a lot of childhood issues and, you know, use it to medicate um and gratefully, you know, it's, it's hard to, to not, you know, be like everyone else in our culture and not to drink, but, um, by God's grace, I married a wonderful man, um, who, um, has like never even had a, a, a sip of alcohol his whole life. And so I'm really grateful for that, which has made it, you know, easier for me. So I know if you're in a relationship and you're, you know, it can be a little harder, but, um, yeah, it was one of the best decisions and it's really God's grace that like, that experience, like, you know, he just gave me that wisdom. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, um, um, there are, which we, you kind of touched upon, um, in the first episode, um, it's kind of a recent discussion about how the, the severe, um, the serious physical, mental, um, negative effects 
alcohol has on our minds and our body. Um, you know, we, I know I didn't grow up really hearing this. You didn't really hear this from the medical community, but there's been a significant, significant shift in the in recent years. Um, mm -hmm. Doctors really exposing how dangerous it is to our health. Um, and so I just want you know, again, we're not, this conversation is not to shame anybody, um, but it is just to present, um, to, to make us aware of really yeah. how destructive this can be mm -hmm. in our lives, even if you don't have an addiction. Um, mm -hmm. And I know you share a verse, I mean, you want to share that verse right now um, yeah. before I, before I make a list of, of the yeah. negative ways that it can affect us. Yeah. Cause I mean, I think we all just need to evaluate for ourselves um, if something is beneficial to us or not. And my husband used to tell me, he's like, he didn't drink really, never struggled with it, gave it up to support me, which he didn't have to do. I'm so grateful. Um, but he's like, when I, he was younger, he used to say, people would be like trying to egg me on to drink and things like that. He's like, how cheesy is that? Like, I'm going to choose to do what I want to do. He just had one of those personalities versus society, which is typically like, we just copy the behaviors of everyone around us. And, you know, the apostle Paul warns us of it in Romans 12, one and two. And I love where he says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way we think. Mm -hmm. So I think we all need to take a moment um, and it, it goes on to say, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing and perfect. So we all want to be like in God's will, right? We all want to please him, but are we being pulled by the world standards and, oh, you're weird because you don't drink and we're letting what people think and say about it determine what's best for us. That's mm -hmm. cheesy and corny, as my husband says, like, <laughs> You know, I like what the Apostle Paul goes on to say in um, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, where he's like, I have the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. He says it again, I have the right to do everything. We all have the freedom to make the choices we want to make for our life, but mm -hmm. I will not be mastered by anything. Another mm -hmm. version says, I'm, you know, I'm free to do as I choose, but I choose not to be enslaved by anything. So if I was to leave the audience with anything today, it is. As you're listening to Allie and I talk about, um, you know, and make you aware of addiction and, you know, how trauma and mental health are impacted by alcohol and how it can go down a slippery slope. We're not saying anything to shame you. We're just saying, would you consider for a moment if it's beneficial for you? I get to wake up with no hangover. Mm -hmm. I get to wake up in the morning with no dry mouth, cotton mouth. I get to wake up and look my kids and my husband in the face and not be ashamed about what I said or did the night before. I get to be the person at the party who is like, no, I'm okay. I don't need a drink to have fun. I get to. Mm -hmm. Like I've reframed the way I look at fitting in cheesy corny. <laughs> It's like, I'm not doing that. Like, yeah, 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 that's really good. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's uh, such a part of our society and, and you're right. Like God invites or uh, challenges us not mm -hmm. to conform and we get to decide what kind of life we want to, want to mm -hmm. live. And, um, you know, I love so much about how you talk about sobriety, how it's really a journey of wholeness. And we really need to ask ourselves, is this serving me well in is my life? Well, is it serving it's me? Good. Is it really making my life better? Yeah. Or is it making my life worse? Or mm -hmm. what is the benefit from this? Right. And we're going to talk a little bit about the physical um, negative effects, you know, um, I know you talked about this in episode one, it can cause liver damage, cardiovascular issues, mm -hmm. high blood pressure, pancreatitis, uh, a weakened immune system, a higher risk of cancer, neurological damage, digestive issues, mm -hmm. even impaired sexual function and yep. um, fertility. It can even uh, cause fertility problems. Mm -hmm. And so no. those are some so of the physical. Um, yeah. You're not restoring. If you're not sleeping, people think, oh, I need a glass of wine to put me to sleep. 
study it because you will find out it actually has the opposite effect. Right. So you're, you know, it's so crazy how we don't, we're not aware of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I kind of think there's being a shift. I mean, people are becoming aware, you know, this mm -hmm. actually isn't really beneficial. This is actually harmful to my health. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I want to steward this life God has given me well. Mm -hmm. um, so I just share that again. It's not to shame you, but to just make us aware and to ask ourselves, is this serving me well? Or am I going to be better off spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally if I if I walk away from this? Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there's the there's the mental um, negative effects. You know, of course, it can cause dependency and addiction. Um, it can impair our judgment. I mean, so many car accidents are just you know involved with uh, drunk driving. Um, it can increase the likelihood of you know making decisions that you're going to regret, uh, engaging in risky activities, um, and so. You know, it's just it's just a conversation that we hope just, you know, gracefully um, encourage you to, to just think about this, to think about your life, what kind of life you want to live. And um, even though, you know, it's such a part of our culture, we do not have to conform. We can make our decisions. And like you say, everything, you know, it's permissible. We can make our own decisions. But is this beneficial? Um, anything else you want to share, Irene? Um yeah. You just brought something to mind um, when I, you were taught sharing, you know, I wanted to speak to the person who was like me. I, I didn't get here overnight. It took, mm -hmm. it took me three years into my sobriety. So I'm going to give you some perspective here. And for the listeners, there might be someone out there that feels this way right now. And so I want to encourage you that if you keep on just pursuing recovery and surrounding yourself with people that are going to help you get to, you know, go down the this journey of freedom because we never arrive. It's a, it's not a destination. Freedom is a journey. I felt like for so long and listeners, you might feel like you're missing out on something mm -hmm. if you don't drink. Right. You're the weirdo at the party who doesn't drink. All eyes are on you. Oh, why can't I was victimizing like, woe is me. Like, um, just Debbie Downer on myself because I couldn't drink and everybody else can drink, but I have to be the dummy alcoholic. Like that's how I felt for three years. And that when I had the, this revelation at three years in where I'm like, wait a minute, I don't have to sound like foolish with a loud raised voice saying things in public that I wouldn't have said if I was not drinking. I don't have to be that person that looks foolish over there. I get to wake up without a hangover. Like it's like something shifts then when I even came up with words and things to say when I, while I was still walking around feeling shame and like, Oh, I'm missing out. I would, I came up with something to say when people asked me why I wasn't drinking, I started telling people I am allergic to alcohol. Hmm. And it, kind of broke the ice and we'd laugh and they would be like, oh my gosh, that stinks. I'm like, no, I'm okay with it. I get to wake up hang without a hangover. But that's what my alcoholism is. I have an allergy now to alcohol. I can't have it. That's why it, I call it a, a disease because, you know, I can't have it. Like it, it, it takes over. So that's kind of the way I approach it. I have an allergy to it and it gets people actually breaks the ice enough for me to be able to tell them that, Hey, I have a problem with it. And if you ever see me with a drink, slap it out of my hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, oh, I love it when people ask me, are you okay? How are you doing at this party with all of these people drinking? If I'm not doing well emotionally, if I'm hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, tired, halt, I excuse myself. I'll tell my husband, come pick me up. Let's go do something else. I do something else. I don't, I don't have to, I used to, in the early on in my sobriety, I didn't even sit at a bar. I had my back to anywhere that was serving alcohol, anything to protect my sobriety. So whether you're at the point where you're like, I'm having a hard time giving it up to being loud and proud about loving your sobriety and everything in between, it's okay. Be gentle mm -hmm. with yourself mm -hmm. and 
just own your own today, own your rec own recovery, own your own health, own your place in this world, own your happiness and your joy and do the work to get free so you can live the abundant life God promised you. It's hmm. not about looking at everybody else. It's about you. Is this beneficial for me? What do I need to do to get to my next level of emotional health so I can enjoy life? Mm -hmm. Period. I love that. Yeah. And I think we can end really at that verse at John 10, 10, you know, the enemy has come to steal, kill and destroy. And unfortunately, really alcohol and drugs have been such a tool to cause so much destruction. Um, but God has come to give us life and life mm -hmm. abundantly. So it's just something for us. Uh, we hope that this conversation um, has gracefully given you some things to consider um, because, you know, God wants his best for you. He wants life for you. Right. He wants to protect you from unnecessary consequences, um, health issues, all of that. So, Irene, thank you for going here with me. You know, honestly, I was like, I don't know about this conversation. You know, it's really? not, a, it's not one that's it. talked about, you know, the, the calling it the beauty of a sober life. Right. But um, I think you and I are just walking in the fruit of that. And we just want to invite anyone. You don't have to conform. You can be part, you can be different. You can yeah. walk in fullness of joy and life. So friends, we just hope this was an encouragement to you. Um, feel free to send a message to Irene, myself. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if this conversation has encouraged you or you think it might encourage someone else, please share it with them. And Irene, thank you so much. You can connect with Irene on social media. Um, you can gosh, see all her amazing messages, interview clips. I know she'll be blessed or you will be blessed by everything that she shares. Um, and uh, we'll also link to her marriage ministry as well, um, as well as her website and her book, Reframe Your Shame. Irene, thank you so much for being a part of Wonderfully Made. I'm just, just grateful to know you. And oh, well, um, thank you for having this conversation because I want this to be the norm. Right. You know what I mean? People mm -hmm. talking about things that uh, we're struggling with. So I appreciate it. I really, yeah. really do. Well, it's, it's, it was special having this conversation with you. So thank you. All right, friends, we will see you next episode. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to visit our website, wonderfullymade.org. You can join our new online community where we're going to bring you Christ-centered content and resources to help you in your spiritual and your mental health. You can grab a copy of my book too, Wonderfully Made. Um, subscribe to the podcast, all those good things. So thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next time.